And sing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, there's power, power, oh, unto working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Words in a lost in this life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, oh, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, oh, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. So would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily, his patience to see? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power. The precious blood of Yeah. 
Amen, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Amen, amen. How about them Astros, huh? Amen. I don't know how to take that. I got more for the Astros than I said that, than I did. Good morning. I don't know. I don't know about that. Well, it's great to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, really, it's great to see our first-time visitors and those of you joining us online. Of course, there's a welcome card and a seat back in front of you. If you have any prayer requests or you want to know a little bit more about the church, please fill that out at the end of the service. We'd love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand if you're joining us online. Uh, you can fill out that same card uh, by going to our website, bfchurch.com. From there, click on the guest tab and then co complete that short survey, and we will be sure to get in contact with you. But right now, let's go ahead and stand up and greet those that are around us. Amen, amen, amen. If you could return to your seats and remain standing, go ahead and return to your seats and remain standing at this time. I'm going to have Miss Liz come down and she's going to read today's scripture. So let's go ahead and stand as we honor the Lord with the reading of his word. This is 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 9. Let's bow our hearts, please. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urge Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. I am not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Father God, we just thank you, Father God, and we praise you for your grace and mercy to us, which we don't deserve, Lord. We thank you that we can, as these last days are here, Father God, that you create in us um, a desire to do your every will, Father God. Let us be humble, Father God, for the things of this world are not what we should be looking to. We thank you that we look to your kingdom, Father God, that um, is here, Father God. The kingdom of God is within us. And we thank you, Father, that as we give ourselves to you, that, Father, everything will flow out of us, Lord. Kindness, compassion, liberality, everything, every good and perfect work will flow out of us, Lord, to others. And we thank you for this. We ask your blessing on our pastors, upon our church, Father God, that the word of God would go forth today in Jesus' name, and we would be all changed. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please remain standing. Thank you.
I come into your presence past the gates of praise into your sanctuary to withstand in faith to face I look upon your countenance in the fullness of your grace I can only bow down and say you were awesome in this place mighty God you were awesome in this place I'm a father you were worthy of all praise to you my life we raise you were awesome in this place mighty God
See you today. You're glad you came to church. Oh, make some noise. You're glad you came to church. Amen. Good to see you today. I won't go into a lot talking about our recent mission trip. I know Gary did a great job sharing much of that last week, but just, let me just share a couple of things, and we'll be talking as well. I have an elders meeting Monday night. We'll be talking about some more of these things. That we'll present some more to you after that meeting. But uh, it was an interesting time in the Lord to, to go into some parts of the world that are so oppressed and so depressed and living in such difficult circumstances to make you have this whole new appreciation for home and all the blessings that we get while we're home. But we did have a very uh, exceptionally good time in regard to ministry there, uh, an exceptionally horrible time in regard to weather, air conditioning, travel, cars, vehicles, transportation, and a long list of other things. But what the Lord did so outweighed all those other things, they really aren't worth even mentioning that much to you. Because God did do, to do a really interesting work while we were there. I think we saw the birth of some things happening that I really believe that the Lord wants our church to be involved in as well, be sharing those things in the future. But uh, as we just, just ask you new to start praying about uh, ministry that the Lord has for us, uh, we've always been a church that is responsive to the things that the Lord puts on our plate. And the Lord has opened unique doors through, in our church through the years uh, for very specific reasons, for us to be a part and for us to, uh, to participate in his plan and into his world that he has going on. I think the song is so appropriate we just sang. I mean, come and see. I mean, the Lord is up to some things. We need to come and see and come receive and come be a part of what the Lord's doing. And the only way to really know and understand that is to get our eyes open and our hearts tender and a mindset to, to receive what the Lord has for us. But it was a blessed time in the Lord of ministry. We did the conference where we were able to talk with uh, missionaries and pastors uh, about direction and to enable them in so many different areas of where they were hungry and where they needed some direction and some, some ministry areas in, and mostly just to encourage them and their families and their, and their local ministries that they're carried out in with their home churches, uh, with the churches that are established. God is doing some really, really incredible things. I'm going to share a little bit of that in the sermon in a minute about what's going on in the world today, but we, are, we have a tendency, and unfortunately a tendency, to be self-absorbed. We kind of just see what's going on in, in our little circle. And we have a terrible tendency never to look beyond our own perimeter, our own boundaries that we set around ourselves. And we miss so much of what the Lord is doing. But I believe that God has had our church in unique places at unique times in his program to be a part of something that is always bigger than us. And that's part of Jesus living, though. I mean, that's part of Christianity. Uh, you may not understand it completely. I don't know if I do all the time, but... We are part of something far bigger and greater than ourselves. And the joy that comes in our lives comes when, when we begin to realize that we can be a part of what God is doing. And we get to share in that, that, that ministry opportunity. So we've been talking in, in uh, two messages beforehand on uh, overcoming recession, depression. You definitely see how it's affected third world countries when you go to those countries and you visit. It's another thing to just be there and touch it in firsthand basis and sense and see the heartaches and that, that are going on around us. But <clears throat> we're, we're now living in a time in our own country. You don't have to look very far to see the effects 
of the economic downturns. I, I was listening to some financial programs over the weekend, and I uh, listened to one interview with a, with a Harvard economist named Kenneth Rogoff, and he was continuing to issue these dire warnings for the, the U.S. economy. And this, this was one day after the Federal Reserve Chairman uh, Jerome Powell had come out and said, you know, we're maintaining this hawkish stance on, on interest rates and continue to increase them. But, uh, he said, it's, you know, it's a very hard time for us, in, not only in America, but in the world. He said, but I'm sure that there are those who will try to encourage you and basically tell you that this is just a light, mild recession. He said, but I think the chances that we're going, we, we have a significant recession are really pretty high. And there were others who were warning over the weekend about this double-dip recession. I mean, it's, it doesn't take much to look around you and see if the values of your homes and your assets are really rapidly decreasing as well. Interest rates continue to increase. Inflation continues to grow. Cost of living is getting to the point of maxing out most people's particular budgets. And most economists, such as uh, Kenneth Rogoff, are saying the same thing. They're predicting difficult and more difficult times ahead it, predicting that not only jobs will uh, may increase, but people filling those jobs will decrease, and that along a line with that, there will be a real drop in wages, uh, not just in American economy, but in every economy around the world. So uh, I'm not depressed, and as we live in this time of recession, depression, we have to realize who we are when we gave our lives to Jesus, that we joined another system. We became part of another economy. And that's the economy of God. Gary, can you get somebody to just give me a bottle of water, would you? That uh, we're, 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 we're not going to focus on what's happening around us in the present world, even though it continues to try to impose itself upon our, on our hearts and our minds and even our emotions to bring us down, to give us a reluctancy, to make us feel despondent. I mean, it doesn't take long to look at where you're, perhaps your 401s or 403s or whatever it might be, IRAs, to see how the, all those things are being affected and the long-term effects of those that will continue for a couple of more years. <laughs> so it's real easy <coughs> to get depressed. But again, that's if you're not looking at another world. The Apostle Paul said we look at things which are not seen. Now, what in the world does that mean? How can I look at something that you can't see? Fair question. We look at things which aren't seen means we're looking at another world, which is a spiritual world, and we're not looking to see some kind of physical sign. We're looking for what God is doing in that spiritual realm. I know that when I gave my life to Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, that I changed completely. Uh, there's still a lot of work God's doing in me, but I, it was a radical change. And for everybody that comes to Jesus Christ, there's this radical change that takes place. But part of that is not just knowing you've been changed internally, that God's working it outwardly as well. But part of that is realizing, thank you, sir. I'm having allergy, recession, depression. <laughs> part of that is realizing I became part of another world, another system, another way of living. I told you once before, when I take a drink, you're supposed to say amen. One more. Now you might wake up. Let's just leave the lid off that for a bit. That's pretty good water. Y'all thirsty too? I wish, I wish Gary brought y'all a glass or cup. <coughs> but realizing that I'm part of another kingdom completely. And that passage that we shared from a while ago, uh, it, it had to do with that, that other world and that other, that other way of thinking. There's, there's this thing that's called in that passage where he said, you know, I want you to know what happened to the churches of Macedonia. In fact, let me just share part of that scripture with you again. He says, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which was given in the churches of Macedonia, then a great deal or deal of affliction, their abundance of joy, and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. <clears throat> just a little background. Paul's talking about a, an offering that, that the Macedonians gave to help the church in Jerusalem, which was going through all kinds of ordeal and persecution and trials and difficulties. And, and so there's this offering going around. Many of the churches in Corinth, and he's writing the Corinthians to remind them about their offering. I mean, 18 months before that, he visited them. He said, hey, we're going to give, we're going to get a big offering. They hadn't done it yet. And so he's reminding them, you, you made a pledge. Let's keep your word. But let me tell you about that pledge. He said, so did the Macedonians, and they did it. He said, so I want to tell you about the grace of God. Now, I know... Most of you in this room have been under the preaching and the teaching of this church for a long time, and you should understand already that the grace of God is literally God moving and influencing his presence and his power and his sovereignty in our lives. Some people describe grace as God overlooking our sins. Maybe you've heard that before. That is such a minute part of what grace is. 
God didn't overlook our sins. He forgave our sins. He acquitted us of our sin and the guilt of our sin, and he removed as far as the east is from the west. So it's not, it's not like I said, well, I'll just ignore that. <laughs> he moved in grace, and he moved in love, and he poured, gave his son as an offering for us to sacrifice so that we could be free, so we could be saved, so we could join in his family and be a part of his kingdom, right? And so the grace of God is God doing all those things in me. It's forgiving me and saving me and, and, and cleansing me and separating my sin as far as the east from the west and giving me a new life and transforming me on the inside and that work that's transforming me on the outside and preparing me ultimately for my ultimate salvation of eternity in heaven with him. That's all grace. Everything that God does in my life today where he exerts his influence upon my life, protection, blessing, uh, whatever it might be, <clears throat> healing, all right, all that's grace. And all that comes under the heading of grace. Basically, you could say that grace is just the miracle of God moving in, the, in his people's lives. So when God does something in your life and he does something in my life, that's grace. He's influencing, all right? He's making a difference. Now, you might call it in some circles that, they're, that have an understanding of it, you might just call it a miracle. Because God is doing miracles in our life all the time. We probably won't know the full details until we stand before him one day. All right, but every, all these things that God's doing in your life, so much is unseen, obviously, but so much is seen. I mean, you have what you have by the grace of God. You've been given what you've given, been given by the grace of God. You enjoy what you enjoy in your spiritual life. It's the grace of God. He's continuing to move. So God's grace is God's movement and influence in our lives, all right? And many times it goes beyond the natural. There's no natural explanation for why I should have joy well, look at the Macedonians. Catch those terminology. He said, I want to talk to you about this grace of God. All right? This miracle moving, this influence of God, which has been given in the Macedonians. I catch it. That in a great ordeal of affliction. <coughs> Anybody have that? <laughs> great or It's one thing to have affliction. It's another deal to have an ordeal of affliction. It's another thing to have a great ordeal of affliction. So that's on one side. On the other side, and their deep poverty you know, so you got, you know, over, over this, 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 this terrible affliction and ordeal of affliction. Over here, I got this deep poverty. Have y'all remember all that song came out in the 70s or 60s when they were stuck in the middle with you? <laughs> they were stuck in the middle of, you know, clowns on the left, me, jokers on the right. Here I am stuck in the middle with you, all right? Well, the clowns and the jokers are an ordeal of affliction, all right, and deep poverty. Now, those are jokers and clowns that have to deal with, Amen. But who's stuck in the middle? I'm stuck in the middle with Jesus. And what's in the middle of this ordeal of affliction and this deep poverty? Anybody tell me what that phrase is? The abundance of joy. There's joy. Excuse me. You said they were deeply poor, not just poor. And you said they had terrible afflictions. How can you have joy? That's grace. All right? That's grace. The grace is overflowing. In other words, logically they should be feeling rotten and miserable. I can't do anything. I know you're taking an offering, but you ought to be taking the offering for us. They didn't say that. All right? We, we, we're the ones who need the money. We're, we're having problems. But grace was, in, was exerted in their, their lives, and so joy is coming. And now instead of being so inwardly focused about what their needs are, ordeal, their afflictions, and their poverty is, they said, we want to do something. We want to be a part. So this is all grace. And the Christian life, when we talk about overcoming recession, depression, it really gets down to this issue that grace is what we need and grace is what we always need in our physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, financial, uh, career, whatever area you want to talk about. Uh, my marriage, all this, you know, no matter what, what's going on in my marriage, I can still have joy because of God's grace. And what's going on in my, in my business, I can still have joy because of grace. No matter what's going on with the economy, grace abounds. The Bible says that God will always make all grace abound to you that you will have all sufficiency in every need. That's what second, as Paul writes the letter in the next chapter, and that's not in chapters and verses, it's just a letter originally, he just goes on to make that statement. It's grace, grace, grace. And let me tell you about the grace that happened to the Macedonians. Here these people were, they're, they're in deep trouble, and now they're begging us, he goes on to say, and urging us that, hey, can we participate in what God's doing? How do you get to that kind of mindset? Because our mindset is not that. I've got problems. You've got problems. we all got problems. Let's just stay in our problems and be miserable. We're just, and, and, and the focus, as we've talked about so often, is always upon my condition, upon my, my situation, and never looking to this other kingdom that we're living in and this other kingdom that we're a part of. Now, to live that way is a grace life. 
Some people just simply call it the faith life. But remember, grace, uh, grace flows and, and gives us faith and it gives us mercy and it gives us hope and all these other things. But it all flows out of the grace of God. And so if we, we experience God, then we can begin to see things completely different. And I really want you to capture this today. I really want you to somehow to get a hold of the fact that no matter what you're in, what you may be experiencing right now, that God is also up to something. God is also doing something. And when you look at the Macedonians, you have to say, well, something in the world is going on here. In fact, Paul's so pumped up about it, he has to, the Holy Spirit's urging him to write about it and write it to the Corinthians of what happened there. So the, the heartbeat, if you saw the subtitle on the sermon about overcoming recession and depression, this part three sermon is a Macedonian mindset. <laughs> how, how do we achieve this Macedonian mindset? That no matter what the condition is, that we're living in the joy of the Lord because of the grace of God. I think there are some principles that, w that, that we can grab a hold of. The Macedonians, as you see what the, the, they were telling Paul, it kind of starts up saying, we want to. We want to be a part of this. We, Paul had shared the need with them before. He's gone to Macedonia. They've taken this offering. He said, take this. We beg you to take it. Oh, you don't need it. I, I can almost see this you know, in my mind because I've done this to people. I've had people come to me when I was in evangelism and even in church life who I knew were in desperate trouble financially or desperate need in their life, and they came with a gift. And, and they said, I want to give this. And in my mind, I think, well, you, you really can't afford to give that. I know a guy who's had some, as a single guy, and he was saving some money for some camping equipment. I mean, he'd really been on his bucket list. That, you know, for three years, he'd been setting aside money to do this. And he came one day and said, the Lord wanted me to give this toward this particular mission, this particular offering. And I, and I think, hold on, you've been working for three years to take that money and go do something with that that you really, really should. And said, no, that, I know this is what the Lord wants me to do with this. And, and, and the miracles did follow, by the way. That's another story. But I just, I, the, the, the experience and, and, the, the, and the example is simple. Is that, uh, we've, we've all had people say that to us. I, I remember telling people, uh, you know, that I, I believe God called me to do something. People say, well, you know, I don't know about that. I, I remember one lady told Kathy, don't marry that guy. He's a loser. You know, he ain't never going to do anything in life. All right. And these were my friends, by the way. <laughs> Don't marry that guy. That's what I told Charity about Terry. Don't marry that guy. <laughs> Aren't we glad we didn't listen to people, right? We listened to the Lord. We listened to the Lord. And if we listen to the Lord, it's amazing what God does. But that's what happens. All of a sudden, boom, now grace starts coming. The doors open. That unexpected begins to happen. But we've got to come out and move our minds away from, well, I just can't do this. You know, I know what you're saying, Paul. I understand the situation. I saw the pictures you showed in the slideshow. They're hungry. They're going with that. But uh, we don't have anything ourselves. That's just me making that up, all right? There was no slideshow. But there was this willingness of heart. And I thought back when I'm thinking about this, how do you get this mindset of willingness? And, and I, I remember the story in the, in the book of Exodus around chapter 33, 34, 35, when the, the Lord is telling the people about the tabernacle, and he's going to take up this tabernacle offering from building the tabernacle and furnishing the tabernacle. Do you, do you remember the story? I say yes, so I don't tell you the whole thing. Okay, good. So, but the, the, the bottom line of the story was, it says, and the Lord put in everyone a willing heart, and they began to give. And the next day, Moses has to stand up and say, stop bringing stuff. No more gold, no more silver, no more offerings. We gave enough. Now, that's every preacher's dream amen Gary. <laughs> no I'll bring anymore we got plenty but it said that the lord had stirred them all up and given them this, this willing heart and uh, now what was that all about now remember these people have been in how many years in, in in bondage hundreds of years they've been in bondage they've been living under the hardships of these cruel egyptian taskmasters they're their lords so to say they can't do anything doing live anyway without permission all right and they they've been living as slaves and they know the promises of Genesis. And now the Lord shows up in their midst, sends Moses into, the, to, into them. He offers them this, the, the, the promises of God and tells them that God's going to redeem them with outstretched arms. He's going he's to deliver them from the bondage of the Egyptians. And the Lord does. I mean, ten plagues, horrible things, you know. He had gnats and fleas and bugs. I mean, God just bugged them to death, right? And then plagues of death until finally they let them go. And they're leaving, Right? And when they get to the Dead Sea, they start complaining a little bit, but God shows up again. Grace is there, and the Red Sea opens wide. They go across and look over their shoulders at the Egyptian army that's following them. Man, the waves just close in on them, and they're all killed. They're rejoicing. They're celebrating. And now God is giving them this word 
that they're gonna, he's going to tabernacle with them. He's going he's to be there with them. All right? And they're, they're, they're getting a glimpse now of what Abraham has promised hundreds of years before them, that they're very familiar with the promises that God raised them up, make a great nation out of them, all right? And so there, there's this joy. Why is there a joy? I think there's a joy because they begin to see that God is up to something and God is moving in their midst, all right? And this is exactly what ha- needs to happen to, to every child of God. Do we learn how to give willingly and excitedly and boldly because we're really getting a vision of what God is doing and what God is doing right now. now. Maybe you don't know. Maybe your head is in the sand. Maybe you're too locked into CNN and Fox and all these other voices that continually to hit us, you know, and you really haven't paid any attention to what God is doing in the world. I mean, God is moving. There are things happening in communist countries right now. There are things happening in, in forbidden places all around the world. And what we need to do is get a vision to see what God is doing. You realize that in Iran and Pakistan and Iraq and China and, and, and Cuba, there are things going on where people are being saved by the hundreds and literally by the thousands. Underground church movements are happening in all these countries and places where it's not allowed. God is doing some supernatural things. People are, are I, I mean, hearing, having dreams and visions of, of the Lord and their redemption and salvation. I've talked with some of these people. I've met with some, some missionaries out of Iraq who told me what God was doing there. They, they're from Bulgaria, and they go in with the gospel into Iraq. All right, these are Muslim nations there. And even with communist China, God is doing some incredible things. And because we don't necessarily see it here, we're not experiencing it. One, because we're not near as desperate as they are. We've been spoiled. We have been absorbed into what we have. And now we're so inwardly turned, we just can't seem to look out. But man, God is moving. There are ministries that we support and that we're a part of in our church right now that are seeing God do incredible and supernatural things. Recent trip is one of those things where God is just moving in unique ways and people are just coming to know the Lord. Right and left, I mean, by the score, things are happening. And, and literally, that's God moving the world today. But uh, uh, do you see any of that? I mean, some people can't even see that. Let me state the obvious. They can't see the obvious. What's the obvious? These are the last days. I mean, what more do we need, evidence do we need, than all the things that are happening before us every day, ever since 1948, with the established by the nation of Israel, it's been like dominoes that are being knocked over, one after the other, with one prophetic fulfillment after another. The only thing left to happen before the rapture is just the rapture. <laughs> All right? That's next on the calendar. But if you can't see that, there's no excitement, there's no joy, there's no unction in your spiritual life. You don't witness to anybody. You don't give anything. You don't spend time in the Word of God. You're not excited about what the Scripture says. You're just stuck in a rut. And I've said it a million times, a rut's nothing but a grave with the ends kicked out. It's just a long grave. And if we live that way, it's because our vision is short-sighted and our eyes need to be open. So if we really want to get to that Macedonian mindset, it's going to come to that place of saying, hey, do I see God do something? The Macedonians had seen God do some things in their midst. Now, Macedonia uh, today would be modern-day uh, Bulgaria, Romania, and that kind of area up there. It's just north of Greece. All that area in Eastern Europe, north of Greece, is, is Macedonia. And they, I mean, it was, they were having a difficult time. But here was God in the midst of all those things doing some super, he's truly at work. They saw him at work. They saw the kingdom going forth. They saw the gospel exploding around him. So I ask you, do you have any concept, any vision of what the Lord's doing in the world? Second to that, do you have any concept or vision of what God is doing in this church right now? In this moment, do you realize <laughs> there are lives that are literally being transformed around you? Hopefully yours is one of them. Do you realize the influence that we have upon our, our world? Do you realize the influence we have upon our community? That what, what we're doing in, in, in discipleship, what we're doing in, in, strategi- in strategies to reach more people for Christ within the community? Do you realize that this little small congregation has launched missionaries onto foreign soils, which have led many other people to Jesus? And I'm not just talking about through our corporate giving through all the Baptist missions, and whether it's state or local or international missions. And we've, we've participated in that for 30 plus years. And so everything happening there is happening because we're a part of it too. And as a result that we're a part of it. 
But individually, our church has set missionaries on the field. Individually, we've supported missionaries on. Individually, we we as a church have trained and encouraged. Literally, now this is not an exaggeration. Thousands of pastors in foreign countries, you know, to help them, encourage them, and see them build upon what God has done in their life. I mean, do you do you know that we're we're in a place in our life right now, and this is where I, I get so frustrated as a pastor because people just fail to see it, again, because we're so locked into our little tiny nothing world when God's doing so many bigger things around us. And it, sometimes it gets disheartening because people just won't get the vision. They just won't see it. Come on, look up. Jesus said the fields are white unto harvest. I mean, it's, it's, it's like that Moses said, hey, and, and Joshua said, repeated in, in another instance, he said, hey, hey, look out and see. Tomorrow God's doing wondrous things among you. You know, and what he was saying, hey, it's being prepared right now. There's a preparation process, and all that brings forth fruit. I can't tell you the, the numbers of hearts and homes and lives that were just touched in a little three-day conference. You know, you look at 80 people there and pastors and missionaries and see what they will go out and touch those villages. And those villages will touch other villages, and other people will be receiving from that as well. These are just supernatural things. That's where you, you've got to have the mindset. But, so, but let me bring it down to really right down to where you're at. Do you even have a vision for what the Lord's doing in your life? Oh, I got all deals of affliction and whatever that other thing was. <laughs> Deep poverty on the other side. If that's all you see, that's a miserable way to live your life. And you won't overcome recession, depression. You're just going to be sucked down further into it. And you'll listen to the continued negative reports. Hey, listen, the more negative reports I hear about what's going on in America, the more I rejoice because I just believe that God's probably and most likely getting us to place to reduce us so we get hungry again and desperate again or to refine us in these last fires to get ready for his return. One or the other. I'm, I, I love America. I'm a patriot to the core. But I have another kingdom and my first allegiance is to. This particular American kingdom the Russian kingdom, the Chinese kingdom, the Babylonian empire, all that's going to come to an end. And the only kingdom that will be standing when all the dust settles and the last word's been said will be the kingdom of God. And every prime minister, every king, every potentate, every power will come to that king of kings and kneel down and confess that he's Lord. That's the kingdom we're a part of. That's an everlasting kingdom, and it will not fail. And we ought to see that in my life. I'm a part of that. I am a part of something that's bigger than me. I don't need to be looking around and gauging where I am, how I feel, what I can do based on what I see with my eyes. I need to open my heart and my mind towards heaven and say, God, what do you want to do with me? If we get that kingdom mindset, it'll affect every area of our life. I mean, we all know. I don't mind if I preach a little bit, right? <laughs> we all know that as Christians that we are supposed to glorify God with every part of our life. Right? We glorify God with our jobs, we glorify God in our marriage, we glorify God as parents, we glorify God as children. All our lives are for the glory of God. Everything I have is to glorify God. Everything I say is to glorify God. Everything I eat is to glorify God. Everything I do is to glorify God. My whole life as a Christian is about what? Glorifying God. But the problem is nobody does that hardly. There's very few people who live that kind of life. It's all based upon, well, you know, I'll glorify God with this. <laughs> I, don't know, I just can't. I'm not, it's deep poverty and overcoming oppression of, and the ordeals of affliction. The Macedonians were surrounded by those things, but those things did not dictate to them what they would do. Well, Brother Joe, you know, I'm, I've got need. Well, we all do. But my God shall supply how much? All my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Of course, the premise for that promise is a few verses later. He says, I thank God that you contributed to the needs that we had in this ministry now because you were faithful to give. God's going to give to you. That's what he was saying. But we want to claim the promise without claiming anything to do with the premise. I, I need some financial blessings, but don't expect me to give any money. All right? Now, I know for the most part, let me gauge this out, maybe 70% of you, really don't want to hear this sermon. I, I, I knew that before I preached it, okay? I'm not a masochist, all right? I just don't like to torture myself. <laughs> but I knew when I started preaching something like this, you have to deal with closed minds and people's opinions. 
But I just want to shake you a little bit today. Think there's more outside your closed mind than you understand. There's the mind of God. There's the will of God. And that God has told me that I'm to glorify him with everything. Everything. And there's no selective process. Well, I can do this, but I can't do that. I want to do that, but I don't like doing that. So I won't do that, but I'll do this. We said before, this ain't Burger King. You can't have it your way. You know, this is the kingdom of God. What do you want, God? Here it is. I'm available. Can I get an amen? I mean, that's what it really boils down to. I don't like that. I'm sorry. I'm not apologizing, by the way. I'm just sorry you don't like it. But I'm not saying I'm sorry I said it. Hopefully, you'll get it this time. But this is where there's so much, you know, deep poverty and there's so much old deals of affliction. We just forget about the grace of God and the joy of the Lord. And we just get locked in so we don't really get a vision for what the Lord is doing in my life. You know, some of you don't, don't see that. You, you don't realize that God has called you to win people to Jesus. You don't see that God has personally put upon your plate and your agenda to disciple somebody in Jesus Christ to, and continually to be discipling people. Maybe you don't see that God has put it in your, your heart to be a part of the financial system of the way things operate in the kingdom of God. Maybe you don't see that God's called you to, to maybe to, to lead that small group instead of avoiding even going. That's the only way I can get it. I'll do it. <laughs> God has something great for us. Quit living this little puny life. This little limited life. There's no joy. There's no fun. There's no excitement. There's no grace being exerted. There's no miraculous. So they come in that, the, the situation surrounded by these problems and said, we want to be a part of something. And, and they, secondly, they just stepped up and said, we can do this. We're able to do this. We want to give something. Most say, well, no, no, no. Paul really messed up here. Paul should have been telling them, hey, you can't really give anything. We're going to come back and take an offering for you next week because you can't give anything because you have an ordeal of affliction on this side and you've got deep poverty on this side, so you're exempt. You think, well, if Paul's a man of God, he'd told them that. <laughs> no, he's a man of God who understands spiritual principles that if they would give, God would meet their need. And they realize, hey, we can do something. Do, have you ever got that point in your life? Instead of saying, I can't, I can't, I can't, because, 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 you're saying, you know, I can. God has blessed me. I can do something. may not be as much as so-and-so, but I can do something. I, I, I told the folks at Magnolia, and that's probably true over here as well, there's some of you probably that make more money than the widows in our church, but I would guarantee you the widows give more money than you give. A widow who lives on very limited income, who's giving a percentage of her income away, if we get the rest of the church to do what some of the widows have done, just to give that first fruits offering to the Lord, it would be an overflow. It really would. It would just be a tremendous overflow. And bless you widows. <laughs> but we, we just think it's, it's all about, you know, no, it's just, it's not about, I don't have $10,000 to give. What, what do you have to give? Now, I've shared this illustration before. I know in the past we've talked about these things where, uh, when I was in ministry in evangelism. And the, we, we were, God was really blessing when the doors were opening and people were being saved and crusades and things and revivals were going on, but the needs weren't being met within the ministry. The money that was coming in was not as big as the expenses going out. Anybody been in that place? That's that uh, ordeal of affliction. <laughs> and I really, I, I told Kathy, I said, I just, we just need to get a word from God. I, I don't know what's going on here and I don't know why we're facing this like this. As much as I know we're being faithful to the Lord. And we're, we're, we're giving the first fruits away to the Lord. I mean, we're doing that already. And so I, I told her, I said, I'm running away. She said, I'm going with you. I said, no, I only have money for one of us. <laughs> I said, I'll be back when I get a word from the Lord. And Terry, you probably met a big old bus we had. I jumped in the bus and ran down and parked it on Crystal Beach. It was a de desolate place down there. And just spent some time fasting and praying before the Lord. And the Lord, you know, and, and he just told me to call a friend of mine who taught me a lot about faith living. And I called him. I said, you know, I just don't know what's going on here. And explain my situation. I said, I really want to get up from where God. He said, well, it's not that hard, Joe. <clears throat> I said, what do you mean? He said, let me just ask you this. What are you, what are you really believing the Lord for in your life right now? You know, what, what are you seeing God do? You know, that some of you did the Experience in God series, you know, with Black Abbey said, you know, find out what God's doing, getting on it. I just wasn't sure. And he says, you know, it, there's this point where you find out what the Lord's doing and you start trusting him. Whatever that means in your life, you start trusting him. Now, I knew this in my head, but I just need to be reminded. 
I was limited in what I was doing because I felt like I was limited by situations and circumstances. And when I started, my, the evidence of my faith became that I began to give more. And God began to meet the need, the need more. But see, that's not, that's not our first reaction, is it? Our first reaction is to withhold and to hold back and to stop and not to do because we just don't think we can do it or we can't afford to do it. And we just miss the faith life. We miss the joy life. We miss the grace of God. We miss that overflowing joy that can be in the midst of whatever's going on in my life. All too often we adopt this, I know this is an oxymoron, Christian loser. All right? We adopt this Christian loser mentality, you know. Well, you know, I'm, I'm just trusting the Lord. I think I'm trusting the Lord, but I'm just really not able to do. And I, I, I would like to start a lift group, but I really don't think I could do that. And I just don't know that. And I'd like to get more, but I just don't think I have the money to do that. And, then, and I would like to, it's all these things we think we want to do and need to do and want to, but we just never get around to doing it. Because we're just locked into this, I just don't think I can do that. I, I don't know if it's possible to do that. You know, remember, Paul had written the Corinthians, and I think that's where they were stuck at. We don't know if we can do this. And they said, let me tell you what the people who couldn't do did. Let me tell you what the Macedonians, they did. And God did a supernatural thing in their midst, and, and he blessed them. I, I'm going to go past that scripture. But I think there's three parts when we talk about this. I want to, I, I, and, I, and I will. I can. I'm able. There's three parts that, that kind of, let me just wrap this up and tell you what I really think that what brought the Macedonians to the place of, of understanding what, what could, God could do in their situation. Part one is, like I said, they, they realized that they can do something and they determined to do it, all right? The Bible says they gave as much as they were able. That's what Paul wrote. He said they gave as much. In fact, he said they did more than they were able. In fact, it's interesting when you look at the, the context, the way the Scripture reads, when he talks about, I testify that according to their ability, and we don't say beyond their ability they did this. The context is here that they took this to thought, and they took this to prayer. It wasn't a matter of just looking at the situation, saying, I can't do that. They said, hey, maybe what, we're on to something. Maybe, maybe Jesus was right. <laughs> I know that sounds foolish, but maybe Jesus was right. When Jesus said, if you give, it will be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. All right, so, and again, it's not a knee-jerk reaction they're making here. They, they really got down, they, and the whole context of the way this is written said they gave themselves, and they gave themselves eagerly, and they gave this offering liberally. I mean, it, they, they didn't dismiss the, the thing as impossible right off the bat. The, the Macedonians wanted to give. The Macedonians looked for a way to give. The Macedonians obviously sought the Lord in what they should give. And they realized, and what the scriptures teach us is that Christians, no matter what their situation is, are to be generous. And that out of that generosity, out of that act of love, out of that kind of faith, God blesses and ministers to and meets the needs. Not only of others, and he talked about that in 2 Corinthians, the next chapter, and he says, hey, that the needs are overflowed and supplied for the Jerusalem church, and, and God was glorified, and all those people are giving thanks. He, he talks about that a bit later on and, and what happened. And I'm going to just pass that verse for now. But the, the essence is things that happened, and th God did things. But the heart of this is there was this step of faith that they made, and they said, we're going to trust him. This wasn't about reason. This wasn't about logic. It says they stretched themselves beyond what they knew they were able to do, verse 3. And Paul writes, they gave beyond what they were able to give. How do you do that? You just do it. How do you do that? I think most of the time we're just locked into what we're able to do. And we're just bound by that and we're stifled by that in our spiritual walk in life. And I just believe that somehow that over time that we can get that kind of way. And it's just a result of, of just not living with an expectation that God's still on the throne and he's still doing miracles and he's still meeting his people's needs and he's still supplying. And that God's not a liar and that God said he'd give to you if you give, then, then you give so you can give some more, so you can give some more. And you just keep that flowing. And the Macedonians, they reached out beyond themselves. They gave what they could give and more. And the second thing is this Macedonian mindset. There was this, it was, it was an attitude of faith when it says they stretched themselves. It means they went outside their abilities. They went out beyond the norm. They, they, they gave beyond what they could give. It, it, it was, I, I mean, Paul, he's not standing saying, no, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. Uh, he, and everywhere around us, we had those kind of people. You can't do that. It's not possible. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't go there. You shouldn't, shouldn't do that. But Paul is saying these people didn't do what should be done or not should be done according to logic or to the world. They just, they just gave out, all right? They, they, they did something that was exceptional. They did something that was supernatural. And he didn't try to prevent them from doing it and ask, well, you need to take care of yourselves. The whole idea, I really believe behind this whole Macedonian process, this whole Macedonian mindset, you know, it's, it's, it's where you just learn to trust God for the future. 
My giving today is my evidence I trust God. I mean, let me say it again. My, my giving today is an evidence that I really do trust the Lord. And I, it's not this selfish thing like the prosperity preachers that God wants to make everybody rich and just get to his. No, I said, hey, I just believe God's going to meet my need if I reach out and meet other needs. I believe God's going to bless me if I'm generous. I mean, over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's so repeated throughout the whole, whole scriptures. You, just, you can just learn to trust God. And I'm not trusting the banker. I'm not trusting my, my IRAs, my four whatever it might be. I'm just trusting the Lord. And I'm not exaggerating that. I'm just saying God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we think or ask. Whatever happened to the miracle God? Did he die? No, he did not die. We are here as a church today because of a miracle God. We stand debt free on all the properties the church owns because we believed God. And because we gave, even when it, there were times we could not give. When we were meeting in this building, when there was no air conditioner, no walls up, we had fans blowing across here. We were running big giant fans just to be cool in the service. You could hardly hear the preaching. People continued to give and give and give. And out of that, God blessed us and continues to bless us because we give. People look at our budget and say, well, you know, we've got to cut budget. We've got to cut those missions. No, we don't cut missions. We cut everything else before we cut that. We continue to be generous, but that's not as a, just as a church, it is as a people. And this was the Macedonians. I mean, their decision was to just do it beyond us. It's an act of faith. We trust God for tomorrow. He's going to take care of tomorrow. It's a biblical principle. It's a simple principle. Once you start sowing, you keep sowing. And the Bible says he'll provide seed for the sower. In other words, he'll give you what you need so you can plant it. And you can be provided for what comes up out of that next harvest, and you can give some more seed. I mean, how many times is this over and over in Scripture? I, I kind of wrote this down earlier. I said there's 277 verses on belief, 340 verses on prayer, 518 verses on love. Amen? Almost 1,500 verses on stewardship, giving, being generous. Reaching outside yourself, that's just over and over and over again. And why so much about money? I love what Bill Stafford used to say. You know, he didn't write so much about, you know, your salvation as he did money. Because he knew it wouldn't take that much scripture to get you out of hell. But take a whole lot more scripture to get that out of you. <laughs> Amen. To get our selfishness out, our greed out, our covetousness out. What's going to happen to me? How can I take care of myself? I'm important. I need to watch out for self first. And that's, that's so opposed to the, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You keep sowing. Paul wrote, you will be made rich in every way in 2 Corinthians 9. In other words, God's going to meet your needs in every way on every occasion. Why? Because you're generous and your generosity results in thanksgiving to God. But, you know, if I'm expecting God to do something for me and I'm not doing anything on my part, that's a false expectation. And you wonder why God's not meeting your needs because you're not meeting anybody else's needs. You're not a part. The third thought about these Macedonian decision was they wanted, it had to do with passion. They passionately wanted to participate. It grew out of a willingness to say, I can, I will, we'll step up, we'll stretch ourselves. And verse 5 said, they begged us with much urging for the favor, the opportunity to just participate in this offering for the saints. Before they did any of this, what's Paul writing? They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. Wow. They didn't set back and offer excuses. They seemed, didn't refuse to be a part of what God was going on. They stepped up, said, that's for us. We're taking part in what God's doing. Listen very carefully to this. You really can't expect God to bless what you're doing in every area of your life, your personal life, professional life, relational, your emotional life, your spiritual life, if you refuse to be a part of what he's up to in your life. But we try and we do. Well, I just don't know what I can do. You don't be like the guy who fell off the 50-foot ladder, but he didn't have a scratch. Ask him why. Well, I was only on the second step. <laughs> That's fine, but you're not going to get where you're going when you need a 50-foot ladder just to go to the second step. God is able to protect you. You can climb. You can stretch out. You can go forth. You, you know, don't be locked into what's happening on the left of you and the right. I think you're onto something when it comes to this part of your life that can take you to new spiritual heights. But you've got to be willing to climb a little higher in your life and go a little further. Famous missionary David Livingston made this statement. 
I place no value on anything I have or may possess, except in relationship to the kingdom of God. If anything will advance the interest of the kingdom, it should be given away or kept. Only as by giving or keeping it shall most promote the glory of him to whom I owe all my hopes in time and eternity. What a powerful statement. God has called us to glorify him in every area of our life. If I keep it, it's for his glory. I'll keep what he tells me to keep. If I give it, I'll give what he tells me to give. But it's all for his glory. And keeping anything, it's for his glory. Sharing anything, it's for his glory. Uh, this is a Sunday we hand out giving envelopes that shows your record for what you gave to the kingdom, we believe in fellowship. They'll be out in the lobby. Someone will be there to give you yours. But even before you open it, I pray you'll pray. And say, so, Lord, I hope this is a reflection of my real love for you. Paul wrote to church when he talked about these stewardship issues. He said, these are matters of love. For where your heart is, there your treasure is. Jesus said the same thing. Giving is a matter of love. It's a matter of faith. And the more we're in love with God, the more we see God doing things, and the more we want to be a part of God doing things. I believe with all my heart in what God's doing in our church. Therefore, I give with all my heart to what God's doing here. I believe with all my heart what God's doing in my family. Therefore, I support my family in a way to glorify God with what he's given me to glorify him. But most importantly, we have to learn to be content. We can't live a life that hinders the work of God because we think we need one more thing, one newer deal, one better something. Kingdom living is completely different. It's just, what are you up to, O Lord? Because when I stand before God, I mean, we just did this study on crowns for those who are in lift groups. Hopefully, I gave you a little bit more of a kingdom mindset to realize this is all passing. It's temporal. It's fleeting. We're going to be standing in the presence of God one day. The Bible says we're laying up in heaven as we give treasures in heaven. I got a feeling some people get to heaven going to be flat broke. <laughs> They'll enjoy the blessings of heaven. But I believe heaven's going to be more heaven for some folks than it is others. And I think the Bible teaches that. I think hell's going to be more hell for some than it is for others. I think the Bible teaches that. Hell's going to be worse for some than it is for others. But I just know that I get to heaven by the grace of God. But I enjoy my life now, and I enjoy the grace of God in my life by making faith decisions and living by faith. I, I'm not going to give an altar call today. If I did, I'd probably just bring the offering plates forward. But, <laughs> but I am going to encourage you to really, really look at your heart and your life. So many of you are faithful to the Lord. You are givers. I praise God for you continually. I, I ask God to not only to bless you, but to continue to pour out his riches upon you. Because I know you'll be faithful in sharing those as well. For others, my heart breaks. Because for 30-something years, some of you have been in this church 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and you still hadn't broke through this simple principle. It just, just never, gets, never gets in for some reason. And I'm praying that the, that thing which is keeping you, I mean, it's got to be flesh, obviously, or, or satanic, that, that stronghold, that barrier there that keeps you from seeing the bigger picture, seeing the kingdom, the vision of, of what God's doing in, in the church, in the world, in your life, that that'll be torn down and you'll just get this glorious sense of God put his hand on me for a reason. He used me to let me be a part. You know, now I get to be a part. You get to be a part. Let's do our part. There's no end to what we accomplish. Amen. When Jesus is what's the center of it and God's glory is the concern of it, there's no end to it. I love you guys. I don't preach this a lot. I don't preach as much as most preachers do. I, I was looking at the records the other day. I think I preached on giving uh, in the last five years three times, four times, you know. In the last 35 years, probably not 15 times, 20 times, max. But when we do preach on it, my prayer is, it's not about getting more money to church. God's going to take care of us. But I want to see you free. I want to see you liberated. You know, 
know, and I want to see your life blessed. And there's no telling what your blessing can do in other people's lives. Because ultimately, it's not just about us. Amen? <laughs> well, I love you. I do thank you for praying for us while we were there and uh, on our trip. We don't mention names for a reason when we're doing some of these things and putting them out. I wanted Gary to share with you last week. Some of you wonder why the live stream was pulled down because we just wanted it for me at church and for you to hear what God was doing. But uh, because of the situations of where we go at times, we don't publicly live stream so most people know what we're talking about. But I appreciate your concern and your love and your passion, especially last year's Christmas offering, which allowed that. Last year's Christmas offering, which allowed us also to do ministry work in South Africa, to do ministry work for feeding people there and continue to work in prisons that, that are taking place there for some of our missions and ministry there uh, through Rita as well. So praise God for what he's doing in, in different places through our church and through your love and your gifts that make these kind of things possible. We'll be not even promoting the Christmas offering for another couple of weeks, but then when we do it, just be prayerful about what the Lord would have you do to be a part of that. I really do believe that we're going to have some opportunities before us, and again, I'll be sharing those in the future, that uh, require us to just continue to be faithful. But I'm excited to be a part of what God's doing. I hope you are as well. When I go, uh, it's you going. When, you know, I, I put that passage in the newsletter, if you read it, that talks about in Romans that says, you know, he said, uh, he said you know, uh, what, nobody, can, nobody can be saved without hearing the gospel. And nobody can hear the gospel unless somebody tells them. And nobody can tell them unless somebody sends them. <laughs> All right? So let's be senders as well as goers and doers. Hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord an offering of praise. Amen. He's worthy. Praise God. Brother Gary. As Pastor Joe mentioned, we, are, we do have uh, your giving statements up to date. So it's uh, effective January 1 through October 31st. They're going to be out there in the foyer. Uh, Bill Robertson is going to be out there. And it's Alpha. I think A through M is on my left as you exit. And then N through Z is going to be on my right as you exit. And so uh, be sure to um, let them know that you're there to get your off your giving statement. Also, our evening activities, Awanas, and you start at 515. And then um, our uh, lift starts at 530. Uh also, I want to put a plug in. It's not up there yet, but I want to put a plug in. Um, Miss Louise and the uh, food pantry uh, are going to be pa uh, get putting out the um, pantry bags in December. And so start. you might want to start picking those things up now because we'll put out the bags in, I think, on December 6th. Uh, but just put a bug in your ear now. Uh, that we will be giving those pantry bags out. And so fill those bags up for our pantry so that we can continue to meet the needs of our community and also our members here at Believers Fellowship. Also, uh, some of the things that she's doing this uh, Thanksgiving season is she's preparing boxes for families. And um, the pantry is, as a church, we're able to bless families with turkeys. And, and so if... Uh, God puts it on your heart to maybe buy an extra turkey for the pantry. Uh, let you know, get with Miss Louise, and uh, she'll let you know if she's still short or she needs any. Um, and and so, if God puts that on your heart to donate a turkey, please get with us or, or Miss Louise so that we could coordinate that time for us to pick it up or whatever. Amen. Um, and, and so, just to again bless the community and, and our members as well. Uh, our shoe boxes are due today uh, at and. Uh, so if you have them, be sure to give them to Pastor Matt. Uh, here's a little secret between me and you. If you don't have it today, that's okay. Uh, bring it tomorrow. Uh, we will be open from 9 to 5, and so if you don't have your, your box with you, or uh, if you're like me and you haven't picked up your box yet, uh, go ahead and get your box, fill it, and then bring it tomorrow. Amen? I think the cost is like $8, $10. What was it, ter uh, Dennis? $10? So $10 to ship it. And so you could drop a check off or you could pay online for that. Our Wednesday night Bible study uh, is Ephesians 
and it's a different concept that we're doing. Um, I thought it went well for those that came. And, and so this week we're going to be going over Ephesians 2. And so if you want to prepare for that uh, Bible study, read Ephesians 2, and then we'll break it down on Wednesday at Bible study. Don't forget our church-wide Thanksgiving meal, November 20th. This is a luncheon immediately following church. You can still sign up for uh, side items or anything out there in the foyer. Get with Angela regarding that. Don't forget to stay connected with us online via Facebook, YouTube, and at bfchurch.com. Um, Looks like home folks here, but still love the opportunity to, to meet you out there in the, in the foyer. Tell me what God's doing in your life. And also, don't forget your tithes and offering. Uh, three ways to give online, in person, or you can drop a check off Monday through Thursday from, again, 9 to 5. With that being said, don't forget our evening activities. You are dismissed.